All right, well, Happy New Year to you. I want to ask as we begin, partially because I'm curious, but partially because I love to freak out people that are germaphobes. If you have been sick in the last three to four weeks, just go ahead and raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. This is awesome, right? And you might be thinking, here's the good news for you if you've been sick. Uh, Jesus welcomes the sick, okay? So you are welcome here. It has been awful at our house. All of us were sick and it was terrible, but it's a great time to be here, and I'm excited to kick off this new series called Masterclass. Uh, where we're going to be seeing how the gospel impacts every area of our life, and here's why I'm particularly excited about it, because I think sometimes we view the Bible, Scripture, Jesus, like we're not quite sure how it relates to us and our life and how we're supposed to live, whether you've been following Jesus for a long time, or maybe you have no idea, and it's the new year, and you thought you might check out church for the first time in a while, and you're like, I'm not sure how it relates. This is why I'm excited, because what we're going to see is that Paul, who we'll talk about in a second, has written a letter in the New Testament called 1 Corinthians that's going to be talking about so many different avenues and aspects of our life. Pretty much every week in this series is going to be different. He talks about relationships and pride and divisions and arguments and all these different things and how the gospel actually relates. And it shows us that uh, scripture is not like, you know, sometimes where you were in class growing up when you were in school and you're like preparing for a test and you're like, how does this relate to the real world? Like you have no idea, like pretty much every math test I ever took, I'm like, who cares, right? Or um, like Brian, who was up here earlier, who came last place in our fantasy football league. I have been playing fantasy football since I was in high school. I have never once come in last, so I have no idea what he is going through this morning. And that's sometimes what we view this uh, the scripture like. And so we've called this series Masterclass because what a Masterclass is, is it's typically a class taught by someone who is very gifted or good at something and teaching us about a specific skill. And so Masterclass, Paul, who we're going to explain, is going to give us a class on life and show us how the gospel actually applies to every area of our life. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or if you don't, there's a black one around you, you can go ahead and pull that one out and follow along. If you don't own a Bible, we would love for you to take that black one home that is our gift to you. As you're flipping there, let me give you some background on 1 Corinthians or what is going on here. Uh, Corinthians was actually a city, so Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, This was in modern day Greece. Uh, Corinthians was a port city, so there was a lot of coming and going, there was a lot of trade, there was a lot going on. It was a very large city, in fact, it was the third third largest city in ancient Rome after Rome and Alexandria, which uh, made one scholar call uh, uh, Corinth the Los Angeles, New York, and Las Vegas of the ancient world. It's kind of what happens here stays here. There was also a lot of corruption and evil. There was a lot of temples to a lot of different gods. At one point, the largest temple ever built to the goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of lust and love, was in Corinth. So there was a lot of that stuff going on as well. Now, uh, Paul writes this book, writes this letter, in the 50s AD. Here's why that's significant. So he writes 1 Corinthians within 50 years of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And here's why this matters, because sometimes people view the Bible and they're like, well, we can't trust it. It was written hundreds of years after the fact. People just kind of had these ideas about Jesus and they just got blew overboard and then they wrote it down. We can't trust it. Here's what's fascinating about 1 Corinthians is that you have uh, you have a study called biblical criticism and biblical scholars, Christian or not, a lot of people engage in this sort of thing, studying the Bible, who wrote it, did this actually happen, all that sort of thing. One of the things about 1 Corinthians Corinthians is it's one of the, Paul writes seven, 13 letters in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians is one of the letters that every single scholar universally across the board, no matter how anti-Jesus or Christianity they are, all agree that Paul wrote this letter. And why this is significant is because in 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll get to in a while, he talks about how over 500 people uh, were around to kind of see Jesus' death or resurrection and to kind of testify to what he's saying here. So what it shows us is this is not some made up book hundreds of years after the fact that has radical implications applications, if true, and this was actually written within 20 years of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, which I find absolutely fascinating. And so, that being said, let's get started in 1 Corinthians in Masterclass, starting in verse 1. Most weeks, we will get more than three verses, but we're going to start slow to kind of ease you guys into class. It's the first day of class, so this is exciting, okay? <laughs> first, uh, first uh, Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says this. Paul. Now, let me stop there real quick. Let me explain to you who Paul is. See, this is why, okay? Not always going to be this bad. Now, some of you may be like, oh, I know Paul. So if you've been following Jesus for a while, maybe you're somewhat familiar with him, or maybe you have no idea who he is here. Here's who Paul was. Paul was a Jew. He was also a Roman citizen, and he was a Pharisee, which means he was trained up as a Jewish leader, scholar, religious leader. He was a religious zealot. Those were his own words. Before he became a Christian, he was out to get Christians. He actually presided over an, an Acts. We see the first 
Christian martyr named Stephen. He was the one there giving approval to it. So he ran around uh, beating Christians, jailing them, uh, killing Christians, right? Because he was trying to stop this movement that had just occurred as a Jewish person who said, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. But then he has this supernatural conversion that you can read in Acts chapter 9. Uh, Paul is on the road to this town called Damascus to beat and jail Christians. And then uh, he's going and all of a sudden, uh, Jesus appears to him. All the people around him can't see what's going on, but they can hear what's going on. So they're really confused. Basically, Jesus is like, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting my people? You know, don't do that. I came here to give you grace and all that sort of thing. So uh, Paul, his life is transformed. He becomes a Christian. He goes to this Christian's house that he's told to go to, and they open the door, and they're like, Paul's here, and everyone's freaking out because they think it's, you know, they're about to get jailed. And Paul's like, no, 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 I'm not, I promise I'm here. I'm a good guy now. I'm trying to figure out this Jesus thing. He appeared to me, blah, blah, blah. And so he has this radical conversion from anti-Christian, wants nothing to do with them, wants to wipe them off the face of the earth, essentially, then becomes a Christian. One scholar said, because Paul was such a gifted leader and communicator and so brilliant in mind, that if he had not been a Christian, he would have been famous for something else. Instead, he becomes a Christian, writes two-thirds of the New Testament. And as a side out as we begin, I just want us to help. The reason why it's important for us to understand Paul and who he is as we get into this book is because of this. And here's, what, here's what's significant about us knowing Paul. What this means for us is that no one is too far gone for God. So as a side note, I don't know what brought you here today. Maybe you're part of New City Church. Uh, maybe you're checking church out because it's the new year and you think maybe I should figure this thing out. You just need to understand, no matter what you've done, have done, or will do, no one is too far gone for God. God, the power of the gospel that Christ came for you, he can find you, he can save you in radical ways, and it's not about you figuring everything out before he gives you grace and forgiveness and mercy. Oftentimes, he comes and meets you right where you are, sometimes in the midst of, de of despair and hardship. That is where God comes because he loves you. Let me give you an example of the power of the gospel, how God finds people where they are. Uh, Mark, many of you know Mark, he's part of New City Church, he's my father-in-law. Uh, he, uh, as an adult, kind of got into the whole party scene, becomes addicted to drugs and alcohol, becomes homeless, all these sorts of things. Life falls apart, life is ruined. He finds himself into this kind of rehab center. As he's there, he meets Jesus. Jesus radically transforms his life, not after he got his life figured out, but in the midst of it, at the deepest part. He's got grandkids now. He'll tell you one of the things that he's most proud of is that his grandkids have never seen him drink anything in his life. They have no concept of this of this, of this this grandfather who before he met Jesus was this drug addict, was a, you know all these sorts of different things. They had no idea. what, what And what happened there? That in the midst, before he got everything figured out, when he was at his lowest of his low, Jesus said, that is mine and I love him and I'm going to save him. That is the power of the gospel. No one is too far gone for God. If God can use Paul, he can use you and he can radically change, transform your life. And that is the person who is writing this letter to the Corinthians. And here's what he says, chapter one, verse one. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So he's called. Here's what he's doing. He's emphasizing that his apostleship was God's choice. Now, what was an apostle? Back when Jesus was around the first century, an apostle was essentially someone who was handpicked by Jesus to essentially be an early leader, a leader in the early church. So, for example, the disciples of Jesus, they were all apostles. We're not sure whether or not Jesus or Paul ever met Jesus during his earthly life, but Jesus uh, comes to Paul, visits Paul, and says, no, I'm choosing Using you to be a leader to, to spread the gospel. And so Paul is an apostle, but he's letting us know and he's reminding us, I'm not an apostle because I got everything figured out. I'm not an apostle because I'm awesome. I'm an apostle because God showed his grace and love to me. He called me, not me. I didn't get everything figured out. How did he call him? By his will, that it was God's will to love and save and give him grace and forgiveness. And it is also God's will to do the same thing for you. What do we know? What does it say in scripture? That God desires all men and women to be saved, that his grace and it is sufficient to all of us. The question is whether or not we will choose to follow him and accept the grace that he has given to us. And Paul's reminded, hey, I'm going to write this letter to you and we're going to talk about a lot of stuff and a lot of ways that you're blowing it. But you just need to remember as we go through all of these topics that God calls you and loves you, not because you're awesome, but because he's awesome not because you're great, because he's great. It is God, by God's will that you and I even get to know him at all. So that's what he says. I was called by God's will and our brother Sosthenes, just real quick, we're not quite sure who Sosthenes is. He likely was a former synagogue leader. You can read about him in Acts 18 if you're really curious. Uh, he became a Christian regardless. The Corinthians knew who he was, who so was significant to them, and he may have even helped Paul write some of this letter. And so as we begin this morning, here's what I want us to know as we begin 1 Corinthians, and that's this that God calls us by his will. 
And here's why this matters. Again, throughout this book, we're going to see all the ways that the Corinthians are falling short, all the ways that we also are having the same types of struggles and issues that they had, that a lot of sexual perversion, a lot of different things that we say, no, we are actually in that same boat as them. And we just need to remember that God is not calling us to behavior modification. He's not saying, you better do these things so I can love you. What he's saying is, I have a plan and a desire for your life. I'm calling you to to a certain way of living, not because I want to restrict you, but because I know what gives you the most amount of joy and compassion and goodness, even in the midst of difficulty. But before we even get to these things, you just need to know that I am calling you to myself, not because of you, because of me, because I loved you. Again, Mark, God called Mark, almost dropped the Bible there. God called Mark where he was, not after he got out of rehab and got a job and got a place to live and is sober for all. No, God called him where he was. God called him by his will. Or Christina, my wife, some of you are familiar with her story. She grew up, she was not a Christian. She was an atheist. The summer before her senior year, or the summer before her freshman year of college, she's like, man, I've been doing all these things with other people. I'm going to start living for myself. And so she starts to lose some of her friendships. So she's sitting at her house at home in the summer, right before college. She's bored. And so she reads this book called Purpose Driven Life. It's a Christian book. And her purpose for reading the book was to be like, I'm going to, I'm bored. I'm going to read this book to make fun of what Christians actually believe. I don't even understand. This is, this, they're so stupid, blah, blah, blah. She reads this book. God changes her life. She gets baptized, goes to college. You know, we get married, all sorts of things. And then she eventually, what, plants a church, right? That is what God does. God called her where she was, not after she stopped making all these bad decisions and stopping. No, God called her right where she was. And he will use the, sometimes the most crazy and random things to do it. So you just need to know, no matter what the reason is you're here today, no matter what you think about God or how you view God, that God loves you and he is calling you to himself. And sometimes he'll use anything possible to show you his love for you. And so that's what we see here, that God is calling us to himself. Verse two, it says this, to the church of God in Corinth. So again, he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church, a very specific people and a very specific church. But then he uses universal terms to describe them. Again, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Sanctified just basically means that uh, those that are becoming more like Jesus. So as you trust and follow him, the hope is that you will become more loving and more generous and more gracious, that you're becoming more like Jesus, you are becoming sanctified. So to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, that God calls us to himself together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And so what he's doing here is he's using a universal tone to describe the Corinthians. Why? Because here's what he's saying. Although you may be living in a certain geographical area, anyone who follows Jesus is part of the large C, capital C, church. So we are all part of Christ's church. No matter where you live, no matter where you go to church, no matter how much money you make, all these sorts of things. If you are a follower of Christ, you are part of God's uh, God's church, that you and I are under Christ's lordship. And, and why is that significant? Because the problems that the Corinthians are facing, the problems and the struggles that you and I have, what Paul is going to say in this master class, that the gospel is applicable and has answers for all these things. And that is what we're going to see. And so here's why we need to know that we are called by God's will. Because our calling is not based on our efforts. Again, in the weeks to come, we're going to see all these different areas that call that Paul is saying, no, you're blowing it here. This is not what you should be doing. Here's, what God, here's how the gospel speaks into this. But before we get into all those issues, what we need to know and we need to understand is that our calling, however, is not based on us getting it right. It's not based on us figuring everything out. It's not based on us making sure we're doing all the things we're supposed to do and not doing anything we're not supposed to do. That our calling, again, is not based on what, who we are. It's based on who he is, that God is calling us to himself because he loves us even when we've blown it, even if when we've completely turned our backs to him, what Paul is saying to them, that you as followers of Christ are under Christ's lordship and he is calling you and I to himself, regardless of how good we are, regardless of how bad we are, he is calling us to himself. It's not about us, it's about him. It's not about us, it's about him. So the question that you and I then have to answer is this, will we accept Christ's lordship or not. So even though it's not about what we do, if we do believe Jesus is who he says he is, that will probably in some way affect the way we live. And here's why this is significant, because Paul will say things throughout the, throughout first Corinthians that will go against kind of our cultural sensibilities or cultural biases. So for example, one of the things that he talks about in, in first Corinthians is sexual ethic and sexual morality and what God designed sex to do. And this is one of the things in our culture that we might be like, eh, I'm not quite sure. Like I love all these other things, but I'm not quite sure about 
this? And the question for you and I just have to, we have to answer is, are we going to submit even in the areas that we're not sure, and even in the areas if we disagree, if we actually think Jesus is Lord? And just think about it this way, right? <laughs> if God knows everything, if he created everything and knows everything, and you do not know everything, regardless of what you think about God, we would all admit uh, that we do not know everything, then would it not be possible that there are going to be some things that God says that we do not understand or we don't disagree with, or we disagree with, but that's because we don't understand the full picture like he does. That there are going to be things, and it's going to be different things for different culture. Like for us, uh, the, the biblical sexual ethic is something that we struggle with in other parts of the world is grace, that God actually gives you grace no matter what, and even if you don't deserve it. Like there's going to be things based on who you are and where you live that you're like, I'm not quite sure about that. And I just want to submit to you, if God knows more than everything, more than you do, could it not be possible that just because you don't know, there are things that I have questions about, it doesn't mean that there isn't a good reason for it. I, I love what Tim Keller says. He's a pastor, theologian in New York City. He says this, it'll be on the screen. He says, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. Like one of my favorite things when people say, well, my God wouldn't do this, or my God would do this. And I'm like, is it God that would do this or is it you? And it's not like a guilt thing, but we just need to understand that God, there are going to be places for every single one of us that God is going to press against our biases and our blind spots. And the question for you and for me is, are we going to submit to him or are we going to not submit to him? There's, there's kind of like three ways that we can view Jesus. One way is we can view him as Lord, that we can say, even though I do blow it and I get things wrong, the overarching arc of my life is to, is to honor Jesus and to grow closer to him. That's one way we could view him as actually as Lord, even, even as we mess up. Or we could view him as a sidekick, and a sidekick is someone like, he's like a genie in the bottle, or I'm going to do good things, and he's going to respond, or just when I get in a bind, then I'm going to reach out to God. Like, he's just there to help me, right? So that's one way we could view God, or we could view God as a joke. Now, we wouldn't say these words, but that's actually what we mean if we completely disagree with who he is and don't think he's Lord. Now, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying this, to, I'm not saying this as like a guilt thing, but like, for example, if someone came up to me and said, Dylan, I'm God, and you need to follow me, and you need to trust in me, and all these sorts of things. I'd be like, no, you're crazy. Like, you're a joke, right? And I, don't, I might say it to their face because I like to do that. But you may regret this or not. Like, if we don't, if we completely reject Jesus and who he is, what we're doing is we're saying he is a joke. And so the question for you and for me is, is he a Lord? Is he a sidekick in our life? Or is he a joke? What is it? And how we respond and how we live kind of shows whether or not we trust him. And so here's what I want us to do. As we begin this master class, and as we understand that God has called us because he loved us, here's what Paul is instructing us to do, and that's simply this, to submit as, to Jesus as Lord. He is calling us to submit our lives to Jesus because God loves us and cares for us. And sometimes we often have this misguided, wrong view about God, that God kind of wants to restrict us and God wants to hold us back. And what we need to understand, again, if God loves us, knows everything, and created us, when he calls us to do certain things or to not do certain things, it's not to hold us back, it's not to restrict us, but it's because he knows, even in the midst of darkness and in the midst of doubt, that if we live these ways, if we follow him in these things, that ultimately le leads to the most amount of joy and goodness in our life. And so the question again is, are we going to submit to Jesus Lord? Or are we going to reject him? And that's the question we have to answer as we go through 1 Corinthians, as Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He's like, I'm going to say things that are going to challenge you. And, it, whether, and the, really the question is, do you submit to Jesus as Lord and with this area in your life, or do you not? And one of the things that we do, especially in Christian circles, and I'm guilty of this too, so this is not like, how dare you, this is, this is me too, is when it comes to submitting to Jesus as Lord, we all sin, right? We all fall short. And what, what do we do, though? How do we describe it? Like when we habitually fall short in a certain area of our life, maybe a certain sin that we always struggle with, what would he say? We say, I'm struggling with blank. And it's kind of like this term to be like, well, I'm never going to quite get over it, and I know it's bad, but I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to say I'm struggling. And what we need to understand, it's not struggling, right? If we're continuing to struggle, as where we say, with pornography or lust or greed or selfishness or gossip, whatever the thing is, it's not struggling, it's weakness. And we just need to call it what it is so that we can actually see what we're doing. And here's the good news about that, is that this is why Jesus came, right? Jesus did not come for people who work really hard, have their act together, and think they do not need him. No, he came for weak, weak, weak people who do not have everything figured out. This is why he came. This is the good news of the gospel, that he came for weak 
people, and we just need to be honest that in this area of my life that I'm continually to sin and to continue to reject God, and it's because I'm weak and I need help. And that is where strength is found. Not when you have it figured out, but when you lean on him. Paul was the exact same as you and I. He was not some mythical, superhuman person. He was just like you and me. And he says as much in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You can turn there or it'll be on the screen. Paul is talking about the grace of God, that we were all given grace and forgiveness and mercy. Now, the thing about Paul, right, is he was pretty much anti-Jesus, and then he's like full-blown Jesus, and he's going around, he's planting churches, and he's getting beaten, and, ki- and, tr- and people trying to kill him, and he's fasting, and he's writing all these letters that would come into the Bible. Like, it, it would be easy to look at Paul as someone who has it all figured out. And Paul's like, I am no different than you. I have the same weaknesses that you do. And so he says this in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. He says, Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Now, we're not exactly sure what the thorn in the flesh was. We're not sure if it was a sin issue or a medical issue. It could be a number of things. It doesn't really matter what it was, but basically what he's saying is, there is God has granted something to happen in my life to keep me humble. Verse 8, concerning this, here's what I then did. He said, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, here's what he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. He does not say my power is perfected when you try really hard. He does not say my power is perfected when you get your life together. No, he says my power is perfected in weakness. And you understand that you have nothing to prove, that you've got nothing to add on your own, but he came for you. And then he says this, therefore... I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. What do we normally do with our weaknesses? We try to hide it. We don't tell anyone about it because we want to appear like we've got it all figured out, we've got it all together. And that will drive you, we'll talk about this in a few weeks away, that will drive you away from Jesus by you having this false veneer that you have everything figured out. Listen, you are screwed up. I am screwed up. And the good news is this is why Christ came. Verse 10, here's why. So I take pleasure in my weaknesses. He's not saying I take pleasure in my sin and my hardship because it's good, but I take pleasure in it because it shows me my need for him. Take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am, what does it say? For when I am, that's it. Oh, come on. For when I am, it's the first day of class. You've got to be excited for the first day of class, okay? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Again, not when I have it all figured out, not when I, on my own strength, am good enough and I don't need anyone's help, not when I am, know everything and I have no more doubts. No, when I am weak, when I understand I'm weak, when I understand I need help, that when I'm leaning into Jesus and the power that he has given me, that is when I am strong, which means that this is not about you. This is about Jesus and what he has done for you, which makes it all the more better when we talk about the graciousness that God still loves you and chooses you in your weaknesses. That's what we're seeing here, that the first Corinthian, the church in 1 Corinthians was screwed up. It's so funny to me. Sometimes we have this idealized version, uh, idea of what the church was like in the first century. We're like, we want to be a first century church, and we want to do all these things in the first century. You may not know this, but the first century church was racist. Um, there was a lot of racism, if we use modern terms for it. Um, there was a lot of jealousy. There was a lot, why? Because they were just as messed up as we are. And so when we understand that we're weak and we lean into Jesus' strength and not our own, that is good news for us. And that's what Paul is telling them. He's what he's telling us, is that you do not have it all together, but God is calling, calling you not because you, it's because you don't have it all together, and he's showing you his strength. And you will only experience his strength if you lean into him and who he is and not try to live on your own. That is what he is showing us here. And in verse three, the last thing that we're going to read in the beginning of his introduction this morning, he says this, it says, grace and peace to you from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this was a typical greeting, in a lot of Paul's letters. And here's what he's saying, that grace and peace to you, even though God is not pleased with many of the things that you are doing in your life, grace and peace to you and to me, even though there are things that we do that shame God and that we do, that, we, that reject God and how we live, that there's still grace and peace to us. Why? Because we have peace in Christ because of his grace. Grace and peace to you, not because, again, you're awesome, but grace and peace to you because Christ has offered you grace in because of what he has done. And if you are in Christ, you receive grace, peace, and mercy in him. And so here's why we need to submit to Jesus as Lord. 
Because grace and peace is found in no one else. Grace and peace is not found when you try really hard and then you blow it and then you kind of feel guilty and then you have to start all over. Grace and peace is not, fo- not found when you don't tell anyone about your weaknesses so you can put up this false idea that I've got everything figured out. There's no grace and peace there. That's just hardship and triumph and, and fall. And that's just that's a lot. Like you do not have everything figured out no matter what you think about Jesus. One thing, that, one of the things I love is that no matter what you think about Jesus, like you would all admit, all of us would admit that we have done things that even we would say are wrong, right? So we all need grace. We all need peace. And Christ is saying, this is why I came. I came so that you could experience the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And so that being said, here is uh, lesson one, if you will, of masterclass. Here's what I want us to know in these first three verses, and that's this, that your calling is based on who God is, not who you are. Your calling is based on who God is and what he has done, not who you are and what you have or have not done, right? And it's the beginning of the year. So again, there could be a lot of reasons why you're here. Maybe New City's your home. Maybe you're trying to figure this thing out. Maybe you're not sure about Jesus, but you're like, it's the new year. So maybe you need to come and check this out. One of the things that our culture gets wrong about God is that we view God as distant, as smug, as like doesn't care about us unless we're like, we're really good, great people. And what you need to understand understand is how does the New Testament, what is one of the ways the New Testament describes Jesus? It describes Jesus as a friend of sinners, completely opposite of the way that we often think about God in our culture. And here's why this is significant. If Jesus was around today, I am fully convinced that he would be blasted by so, on social media and by all sorts of people because of the people that he loved and hang around. And hear me, he would not just be blasted by like the big fundamentalist people that are really, no, he would actually be blasted, if I'm being honest, probably by you and by me. Like he would probably do things that were like, Jesus, I'm not quite sure you're supposed to be doing that. That is why he got the name friend of sinners because he hung out with the prostitutes. He hung out with the tax collectors, which were like the worst of the worst. He hung out with people that everyone says, you don't deserve forgiveness. You don't deserve grace. I mean, I don't, I don't know what this is for you. Maybe someone who's really racist or really sexist or whatever, it, whatever you think like the really bad sin is, like you should not be doing this. Like that is who Jesus would have hung out with and he would not have been ashamed by it. And this is good news for you and for me because you and I are sinners. You and I fall short, which means that we need grace and forgiveness. And God is not some distant God that doesn't care. Instead, this is the gospel, that Christ came not because of we were awesome, because we needed him. While we were sinners, Christ died for us, right? 2,000 years ago, his death, burial, resurrection, he came, lived the perfect life, not just in deed, but in thought and action every single way, so that anyone who would trust and place their trust and faith in him would get grace and forgiveness and love, and one day we'll be able to enter into his kingdom where it's going to be absolutely amazing, not because of you, because of him. Not because you're great, because he's great. Not because you're awesome, but because he's awesome. Not because you have it all together, but because he has it all together. Here's the thing about resolutions, revela- re- resolutions. I don't even know. And here's the thing about you, because I know this is about you, because I know it's about me. What do we always say? New year, new me. That ain't true. It's a new year, and it's the same you, right? Any of the resolutions you have in six weeks, you ain't going to be doing them anymore. But guess what? It's the new year, same you, but it's also the same God, and he's going to be sitting there right there waiting for you whenever you want to call on him because he came for you. It's not about, you know, I'm going to eat healthy now, and I'm going to exercise, and I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. every morning. I'm going to do all these things. Right? It, that's great, right? But that's not. Jesus loves you today. That's some future version of you when you've got everything figured out. He loves you today. That is why he came for you. Again, your calling is based on who God is. The good news that he came to save sinners. The question is, will we submit and give our lives to him? Even in the midst of our doubts and our questions, it is okay to bring those to him. That is why he came. Your calling is based on who God is, not who you are which is good news because you will and do blow it. I will and do blow it. And God views us no differently. He doesn't love us any more or any less. And we give a lot of money and read our Bible every day. No, he loves us the same. And he's calling us to himself because he wants to call us to something greater. And you will never experience the love and mercy of Jesus if you think it's about you and you getting everything together and you acting a certain way and you pretending like you have no problems in your life. You will never experience the power and the grace and mercy of Jesus until you lean into his power 
and not your own. So as we begin 2019, as we begin this new series, again, as we talk about issues like pride and sex and arguments and divisions and family and relations, as we talk about all these things, we need to remember that God is not asking us to live a certain way so that he can be more pleased with us. He's asking us and he's leading us down a certain path for our good. And it's all made possible because of what Christ has done. So whether you're here this morning and you've been following Jesus for a while, or maybe you have no idea about this Jesus thing, you and I, we all need to know and be reminded that your calling, that God loves you and is calling him to him, you to him, not because of you who you are, but who God is. You're not awesome. You're not amazing. And I know it's 2019. I'm not supposed to say that, but it's just true. I know a lot of you guys. And <laughs> ask my wife. She'll tell you the same thing about me, okay? We're all messed up. It's not about you. It's about him. That's why Christ came. Let's pray.